All right, well, welcome to church in person, to our dream team and online. See a few more faces showing up week by week in our dream team as we're getting out of the habit of online. And uh, so excited to be opening hopefully soon. Uh, anyone excited about that? About <laughs> uh, in the next few weeks, I'm sure we'll be fully open. And uh, so get yourself, if you're online watching in your pajamas, get yourself ready to get back into routine, productive, and back to work and all that stuff as well, I'm sure too, uh, or at least in, in the office. But uh, we're at the third part of a series on, on the book of Nehemiah, the story of Nehemiah, and the kind of story really is about an ordinary guy rebuilding the walls uh, that had, had been in, in ruins for, for decades. And, and the, the walls of his people he, he was a thousand miles away, living in luxury, living in comfort, and really probably in his flesh, in his natural desire, didn't really want to do anything. But something sparked up on the inside of him, and he's he seen injustice, he's seen slavery, he's seen vulnerability with the people that he loved. And because of love and what he loved, he was inspired to get uncomfortable, he was inspired to make a difference. And that's a big part of our vision statement as the church, it is to know God, to then find freedom, discover a purpose, which Nehemiah did, and then actually go and actually make a difference, both spiritual and practical. Um, so often, I know I've done this before, is we can very easily talk the talk, right? We can very easily praise the Lord, hallelujah, but, but sometimes when it comes to actually making the difference, that's where we have a full stop. That's where we kind of fall short. Because why? We're afraid. We're afraid of what might happen. We're afraid of resistance. And if we look at a few people that we see within the scriptures, we see Adam and Eve had an enemy, Satan, tempted by an apple or, or some kind of fruit. I know people say an apple, but it was just on a tree. Now, if David had who? Goliath. He also had Saul. He found resistance as he was trying to fulfill his purpose, discovered purpose, making the difference. He found resistance. Then we had Samson and Delilah. Resistance as he, as he had gifts, he had talents, and he was trying to pursue that resistance. We had Jude. We had Jesus, and then we had Judas. We had Batman, and we had Joker. Robin was supposed to be on his side. It's one of his. We had Portadown FC, and then we have Glen Avon. And so, today we're going to talk about when opposition shows up. When opposition shows up shows up. Let's pray. God, I just thank you, Father, that when we, you are for us, who can be against us? I pray that, Father, when we're going to pursue the purpose you've put in us, when faith rises, God, may, may, may fear bow at its name. We thank you for the name of Jesus. I pray you help me speak your word, Holy Spirit, through me, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Everyone said, well, we've got to get out of the comfort zone. We're getting into purpose. We're getting into making a difference. We're going to have to get a wee bit louder. So just watching the screen and kind of being 10% engaged, we're going to start bringing that up to 20 to 30, and then we're going to hit the streets. Is anyone up for that? Yeah, three people. <laughs> so they started to rebuild. We're going to pick up on the story of Nehemiah. They started to rebuild the wall. They had arrived on the scene. And these, this bunch of people began to rebuild. So it, it actually got there. Did you know half the battle is just showing up? Some of you want to grow in your relationship with God. Well, half the battle is showing up in prayer regularly. 
half the, the battle is showing up to church, God's only plan. Half the battle is just showing up to your family. If you want a better family life, half the battle is showing up. They showed up. They got there. But when they got there, some other people showed up. It's funny, when we look into the scriptures, we see that who was on the scene, Nehemiah, I don't know about you, but when you're trying to build something, or maybe you're starting a business, or you're trying to start a football team, or you're trying to start a church, you're looking who's around. Who's, who's on the building site? I'm currently living on a building site, and we see all this crazy equipment, big Jesse B. Diggers, and these big John Deere, Massey Ferguson, tractors, all these different kind of, kind of massive apparatus to move big soil and, and get big jobs done. And, and I'm sure Nehemiah's thinking, that we're about to build a wall. I need people with talent. I need people with gifts. I need people with ability. And, and who, who shows up? Goldsmiths. Who shows up? Perfume makers. The, the perfume shop. The employees from the perfume shop arrived on the scene as you're trying to do construction. Merchants, I, I don't know about you, but if I was Nehemiah, I, if I'm looking in the natural, I'm not encouraged. I'm already seeing problems. I'm already seeing potential issues. How are we going to build this wall and not just build it, build it so it doesn't fall again? But this is who showed up, and I, I want to encourage you. Some of you are sitting here watching online, and you think, I don't really have much to offer. I'm like the person in the perfume shop. I just, I don't have the ability to go out and do the ministry. I don't have the ability to do the work of Jesus. I don't have what it takes. I'm just a, an ordinary person. Well, so was Nehemiah. And so is everyone in this room that, that runs every one of our, our services. And, and so was the greatest evangelist of all time, and all those people, they've just been ordinary people that have unlocked potential. I was actually talking to Laura, who's on the camera, this camera right here. And I was like, Laura, when you came in, and look, if you've heard Laura's life story, she kind of came in, maybe had lost her confidence. When life had dealt her maybe a bad hand for a season. Would you agree? <laughs> yeah. Life can be tough. Can anyone give me an Amen. And sometimes we go through the mill and it's not what we wanted or, or what we asked for. It's not even close. It's the comp complete opposite at times. But, but he, he, she came in and, and really, probably it's like, uh, what is this going to be like first and foremost? But, but it, fast forward, she's, she's now running the camera and the switcher at the back so you can watch online. Uh, come on, put our hands together for a production team. <laughs> But, but my point is this, she never in a million years probably dreamed, she didn't even have an idea, a thought that she would be on a, on a tripod, moving a camera, on a switcher with this technology. She probably just knew the first thing about a year or two years ago. If I'd asked her back then, she would have said, no chance, like I'm not interested, that's not where I want to serve, just stick me on the kids or stick me you know, somewhere where I'm familiar, some, something I'm comfortable with, but, but not... And here she is serving people, helping people like her find Jesus, see life change, come to know God and find freedom. But, but she didn't see it initially. And see, if you don't have eyes to see, you're blind. You're blinded by fear. You could, Nehemiah could easily have been blinded by what's going to happen. I, I, don't, not, I don't know how we're going to do this. I, I want to give up. And if you think enough about negative situations and and surface situations, you will give up. You won't even get started because you're like, what's the point? We don't have what it takes. But what if you had an attitude of, I'll do whatever it takes. I will unlock whatever it needs to unlock. Maybe, maybe you're in here and, or maybe you're watching online and there's a problem that you see and you're like, but, but we need someone with the degree. We need someone with the training. Or maybe you don't. Maybe you need somebody with the heart. Maybe you need somebody with love. Maybe you need someone with a burden. Listen, I would text someone with a burden and that hasn't been tra trained up than someone that has been trained up without the burden all day. What, what is it we say? God doesn't qualify the called. Is it, I'm going to get this wrong. He God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. 
Meaning, he wants the heart first. He wants you to have a burden first. He wants your heart to break for what breaks his. Then we'll go from there. There's people in this room watching online. There's things God has in you, has in you but can't come out until you get onto the building site. The church is a building site. We're, we're here to unlock people's potential and send you out into the world. But here the problem is, is when that happens, when the work goes down, often opposition rises up. That's, this is where we get discouraged. This is where, if we're not aware before we pursue it, we give up. Because if you have a fantasy of perfection and you arrive on the building site to build and you realize you, you don't have the qualified foremen, you don't have the Jesse B. Diggers, then, then you'll give up because your expectation is not met. But if you go knowing that I'm going with God and he will make a way even when there seems to be no way, you will not give up. You will just wait and keep pursuing practical things until something shifts. And I believe that's why Nehemiah was able to rebuild the wall. He didn't go with a mindset of perfection. He didn't go waiting for everyone to be perfect and, 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 and everything, uh, you know, every T to be crossed and I to be dotted. He just went knowing that if God is for me, who can be against me? If God's hand is upon this, it will happen. But the problem is he also understood there will be resistance potentially. Hence why he asked the king previously, can you give me protection? Can you give me provision? Can you get, he understood opposition's probably going to rise up here, and I need protection. So let's go on to Nehemiah 4 and 1 and 2. It says this. Then Sambalat heard that they were rebuilding the wall. He became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates, the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble? Burned as they are, Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at, the, at his side, said, what are they building? Even a fox climbing up on it would break their walls of stone. stones. That word feeble actually means, in the original context, a flower that is chopped off. A flower that is chopped off has no hope, is destined to fail. There's no root system, there's no stem, it's over. They were mocking, they were looking down upon. Listen, if you're about to do something out of the ordinary, if you're about to break some captives free, if you're going to break some chains off some people's lives, expect resistance. Expect mockery. Expect people to not understand. Expect people to try and keep you down. To mock your skill set. Listen, even if you're only starting and maybe the wall isn't perfect, it doesn't mean it won't finish well because it's not about how you start, it's about how you finish. Have you ever seen a child trying to walk? How many times do they fall? Endless times. But they get there in the end. But it takes fall after fall learning after learning. That's what true discipleship truly is, is to learn. It's not to be afraid of starting a connect group because you don't know where Leviticus or Numbers is. It's to say, I've got a heart to pursue God, to help people. I'm just going to create a space. I don't know it all, and that's okay. But I'm, gonna, I, I'm committing to learn, be a disciple, to be a learner. Is anyone committed to be a learner in here and online? Just to give it a go. Get in process. See, maybe it's interesting. This is funny. Um, it's not really funny, but maybe some of you come to church and you've decided to come to church in the past. And, and just as soon as you made that decision, all hell breaks loose. And the kids are crying. And you're like, of all days you decide to cry, it's the Sunday. Or maybe you're in a relationship or you're married and you're in the car and you start to get in a fight when you're going to church. But all week it's been fine. <laughs> maybe you start to start... You say, I'm going to serve in the crash, and all of a sudden you get in the crash, and the dirty nappies are all over the show. And so, someone a baby pukes on you, and you're like, What? I, like, God, I just done something good. Like, I just got on mission. I just started to get, get into purpose mode, and this happens resistance. 
I want to tell you, expect it. Don't be surprised. If resistance rises up, as the stones go down, resistance shows up. Don't ever be surprised. Ad Craig Rochelle said it this way, advancement invites opposition. Advancement will always invite opposition. If you're going to move forward in any area of your life, expect resistance. If you're going to try and get fitter, expect resistance. If you, if you want to have a better attitude, if you're saying, right, I'm going to work on my attitude on patience, well, the only way to work on your attitude of, and, and experience more patience is to have a situation where you do not want to be patient. So maybe that person that you really dislike because they're so slow, hurry up. <laughs> maybe that's exactly what you need. Maybe that's exactly what the doctor ordered, as they say. If, listen, if you want an easy life, we all want an easy life, part of us. But if you want an easy life, you know what to do. I'm going to give you some advice. Don't pray. <laughs> Don't seek God. Don't show up to life. Don't give anything. Don't invest in relationships. Don't sacrifice anything for anyone. Don't obey God. Don't seek purpose. Don't do it. If you want an easy life, be quiet. When you see things wrong, just go with it. When, when there's a problem society in your family, don't, just don't un, unruffle people's feathers. Just let it be. Easy life. The enemy doesn't care about somebody living the easy life. You're right where he wants you to be. Satan is very pleased when you live the easy life. Because when you step up and step out, the devil will always step in to stop you. Always. That's why these things happen. That's why there's a, there's, a, there's a spiritual resistance. The Bible says that our fight isn't, listen, it's not people. You, I know these things happen and these people get in your way and these people say that at work. But it, our fight isn't really against people because the Bible says in Ephesians, our fight is, isn't against flesh and blood, but it's against the powers and the principalities of darkness, the spiritual realm. So as much as it's, it's brought to you in a form of a person, potentially, they're not your enemy. The people aren't your problem. And we've got to see beyond that. We can't, you know, what that does is that sets you free from taking things personal. Sometimes not everyone's out to get you. You're not the victim. That's Jesus came to give you victory. Meaning even when the enemy resists, attacks, uses people, you don't have to fall for the trap. You don't have to be distracted. Can I get an amen? amen. See, that? have you ever been, maybe some of you have been in some of the big stadiums, football stadiums in England, watching football or, or maybe another sport, Gaelic or rugby or whatever, it been Lansdowne Road or I don't know. But you'll notice that the closer you go to the pitch, the more money it costs. It's more valuable. It's a better experience, right? You're more involved in the game. You're more attached to the players because you're, you can see them. Like they might be, if you're in the front row, you can, they're just right there. And if you're in Lucky Canton, I will run in and karate chop you. But you're, that's how involved your resistance comes if you give the wrong. But what I've noticed is, in life is the biggest booze often come from the cheapest seats. Meaning the higher up in the stand, the cheaper it is, right? The, the back row hards, the back row. What's the back row represent? Often the people who aren't as involved. I, I don't want to be too involved. Like put me on the back row. Just kind of seeing what's happening here. Sometimes in your life, the biggest booze will come from the from far away, from the cheapest seats. The people who haven't invested in you the most. The people who don't even want to know your heart. But they're happy to criticize from afar. That's what religion does. When it's just a form of religion or a form of godliness that's not got a heart. What happens is they, they can criticize from afar. I see those guys over there. It's a disgrace. Ugly. Shouldn't be doing this. But they don't know the Why? 
And this is what I believe the Bible says about conflict resolution in life. It's, it's you go to one-to-one first. That's the, it's, honestly, the amount of things, I believe 90% of things could be solved if you go and hear somebody's heart. And you understand why they do what they do. And you start the conversation. Because the cheapest seats always produce the biggest booze. It happens, it's the same in church. The critics in the church aren't usually the one ones in leadership or aren't usually the ones involved. It's usually the ones who are in the periphery. Have you ever heard of a backseat driver? <laughs> They're happy to criticize your driving, but are you driving? Oh, I can't wait till you get in the seat. This is a leadership strategy I'm starting to use, so get ready. The people who criticize the most, oh, you want to leave? Come on ahead. We can't wait for you to get in the seat. We can't wait to see how perfect your leadership is. <laughs> And I, I found this myself because maybe I was a backseat driver or a bit of a critic at one point. And I realized, and it humbled me when I got to lead myself as I started to see the things I didn't like in somebody else in me. Woo! It's very humbling. So, so the question we, we need to have is how do we respond to the critics? How do you respond to resistance? What if you want to pursue something but you're too attached to what people think and, and you can't do it because they're getting in the way because you want it to be perfect. You want there to be no criticism. You want there to be no resistance. And that's what's stopping you. So how do you respond? What's what Nehemiah does? Guess what Nehemiah does to the critics? Guess what he said to them? Can you believe, can you believe this? He said, you ready? Absolutely Nothing. See, sometimes the best way to respond to the critics is to say absolutely nothing. Because when you say something and respond to them, you know what you're doing? You're giving them a voice. You're validating their power. You're giving them power. Whereas if you ignore them, what, I love this. I say this to the day I die. What, what does a lion do when a dog is barking at it? Absolutely nothing. Why? You're just a dog. What are you going to do? Come on then. And all the lion would have to do is a Wah! And the dog would probably run about three miles. And sometimes in our life, we've got to understand if you're with the lion, the lion of Judah, you've got to understand if the lion is with you, who can be against you? The, 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 dog, the, the hyenas will bark, the dogs will bark. All day, and you can let them bark away. But I'm focused. I don't need to pay attention to the dogs because I'm with the lion. And if the lion has given me approval, and if the lion is working with me hand in hand, we're going to get this done. We're going to rebuild this wall. And you can bark all you like. But we're not being distracted. You see, often what happens is the dogs barking, the booze from the furthest seats away, the cheapest seats or just a distraction. The enemy is using a tactic to distract you from what he's called you to do. And so Nehemiah realized this in his fantastic, simple, practical leadership. He, there was no response. There was no response. I remember experiencing criticism myself. And I think, honestly, as you rise in, in influence and, and God allows you to have certain roles, I, I think the test that God puts you through is how do you react to criticism? And I remember when I was younger, that happening, and I didn't know what to do, and I remembered I, I, want, I need to find someone for advice, someone I trust, someone who's got wisdom, who's been through this before, and I remember going to him and asking him, hey, what do I do? Like, this is not fair. They're saying this about me, and they're saying that, and it's not right, and they don't know the full truth. And listen, it might have been true, there's probably some things I had to work on, some things the other people had to work on, but, but I was trying to nearly, con I realized I was trying to control the situation. And I didn't want them to say that about me because I knew there was parts of it weren't true and it wasn't fair and all this stuff. And I, I went to this guy hoping he would tell me, oh, use this strategy to get them back. <laughs> and he says, say nothing. The Lord is your vindicator. Uh, and, uh, and, I was like, what? That's a weak response. I, th I was thinking, that's weak. 
Like, give me something to fire back or give me an arrow or give me something. And he just said, let the Lord be your vindicator. God will put things right what needs to be right. And, and that was it. That was the advice over. There was no big spiel. It was very simple. And, and as I looked on down the road, I realized more and more, that's so true. That is so true. And so I, I, that's one thing I want to live by. You see, my goal is not to change the critics. My goal is to do the will of God. My goal isn't to try and bring critics with me Listen, there's some people will, this is what I've also learned, there's people that will criticize you and they'll never change their mind. Even if you're right, even if you prove them without doubt that, that they're wrong, they'll never like you. They never liked you in the first place and they'll always criticize you. They actually didn't want you to do well in the first place for whatever reason and they just find something to use against you. So let's not get distracted. Let's not waste time on people that aren't, for what God is doing in us and through us. Can I get an amen? amen? I love this. And this is something we got, we've been kind of looking at this a little bit with our production and our worship team. Uh, we've been reading a book on, on the reset, resetting our heart and, and just protecting our heart, guarding our heart from, from unhealthy pride. Yet again, pride comes in like a thief in the night. And one thing we got to be careful of, especially in the world we live in, where Instagram likes, Facebook likes, all this like, 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 we can so easily fall into a distraction trap where we're living for the approval of man over the approval of God. And so here's a little tip and something I'm trying to live by. I'm not going to be moved by praise or criticism. Well, that's going to be hard. Yeah, it probably will be. It probably will be hard. Because pride is a killer. Pride actually removes the ability for us to love. You actually can't have pride and love because pride is like a shell. It's like a, building a wall to hold people back from you. And you no longer begin to give. You no longer begin to trust. And so we've got to be careful that pride doesn't get in the way. And so I'm not going to let, what's this? I'm not going to let pride, or sorry, I'm not going to let praise get into my head. I'm not going to let criticism get into my heart. I'm not going to let praise get into my head, puff up. I start to believe my own hype. Why? Because it's destructive, because it holds me back, because it, it brings impurities into my heart. But I'm, I'm also not going to let criticism get into my heart. I'm not going to let me maybe being on a journey, trying to get better, learning, I'm not going to let the critics put my lights out. I'm not going to let the critics destroy my will to move forward. I'm not going to let them become a distraction and cause me to, to build up bitterness. I'm not going to let praise get into my head or criticism get into my heart. The hardest, one of the hardest ones, they're both really hard actually, but sometimes it's very easy. If you're, if you're, you've been criticized a lot and then some people praise you, sometimes you start to lean on the praise too much. Sometimes I can start to lean too much on the approval of man. And, and the problem is that's good for a while. That's good for a moment. But as soon as it's taken away, I'm, I'm, I'm a mess. As soon as it's taken away, I die, on the same, I die on the same sword. That praise me, it also kills me. So we want to live, live a life that is more stable and is stronger than that. So we can actually get the job done. Get the wall built. So once again... Um, we see Nehemiah pray. So he goes on to say in, in Nehemiah 4, verses 4 to 6, Here's our God, for we are despised. <laughs> this is how bad it is. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in the land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight. For they have thrown insults in the faces of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half it's height for the people who work with all of their heart. He's being despised. These people really disliked them. They were really against them. They were plotting to kill them. But they kept going on with the wall. Well, how do we have that kind of willpower? How do we have that kind of confidence? See, that's what I love about Nehemiah, that he was both practical and spiritual. He prayed 
like it depended on God, and he worked like it depended on him. What if we done the same? What if we prayed like it depended on God, and we worked like it depended on us? What if we worked on our crafts, on our talents, on the gifts that we don't even know about yet? What if we worked on those things as hard as we could, done everything that we could to see people come to Christ, used every opportunity to give an invite card out, done all that we could, even when it seemed impossible, and then we left the rest in God's hands and we slept like it depended on God. That's, that's a great tension. So, some of you may, maybe have heard about Calvinists or Arminianists. That's the perfect tension for me. We're... we're a Calvinist believes, you know, God's ordained everything and, and we can't do anything to change it. Arminians believe it all depends on us. And if we don't move, God doesn't move. I believe both. I believe both are true. I believe Nehemiah believes both are true. And I believe if we want to see God move in our hearts, but also outside of our, our lives, we got to pray like it depends on God. And we got to work like it depends on us. Can I get an amen? It goes on to say in, in verse 10, Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of laborers is giving out. And there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. All our enemies said, Before they knew it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. How about that for a good report? <laughs> How about that for good news when you're, you're trying to do the right thing? How many of us maybe tried to do the right thing, but it didn't seem like you got the right report? But listen, I'm telling you, see, with Jesus, with God, it's always a good report. When God be before you, it's always a good report. The people of Israel are starting to doubt. Have you ever been in a situation, maybe right now, you're starting to doubt, where's God in all of this? You're starting to doubt, it seems impossible. You're starting to doubt. Your friends are even telling you, what are you doing? The people who actually have, they seem to have wisdom are even telling you, what are you doing? See, the external opposition will, will only be as loud as my internal securities, insecurities allow them to be. And so the question is, where is our security? Where's my security? You know, when I go to start this church, I've got to ask myself, who did, whose voice had the final say? Did I do this for somebody, some other pastor? Did I do this for some other organization? Did I do, or did I do this and come before God and say, God, I need you to give me peace one way or the other. And if you give me peace, I'm all in. And see, when I do that and I have good foundations, what happens is, is when people come and people go, when, when I get resistance and, and when, when people criticize, I keep going back to that point, well, God, I came before you and I said, what is it you want me to do? What, do I have peace to go this direction? And if you give me a yes, I've got my yes. I've got my foundation. That's where I return to every time. But if I'm not secure in why I don't do what I do, if I'm not secure in where I'm going, what happens is I'm under attack. I have no foundation. I have no shield. I have no strength. And I'll be defeated. And this is why I believe prayer is so key. Before we do anything, we have to pray. Because this gives us a foundation that cannot be defeated. It gives us security and confidence that can't be broken. And what I see here is... This is what Nehemiah's response was. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember. Everyone say remember. Everyone say remember. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your families, for your sons, for your daughters, your wives, and your homes. So what did he connect it to? He connected to God and to people. God is with us and we're doing this for people. 
and not just us, generations to come, our families, our friends. Every time I think about planting a church, I was actually dreaming about different locations the other day, and I was thinking, Philip, have we done that? Think about all the stories that we've had already in a short space of time that we might have in this location. And, and what the love that I had in my heart was to see a person changed, was to see a family given hope, was to see a, a person receive salvation, was to, to see a, a family transformed and healed. And I just thought, Flip, if, we, if we, we build right now, there will be a trickle effect later. So when we serve now, it's crazy to think about it, but we're not just serving our community, but we're also serving future communities elsewhere. Future families that know not of this, not, know not of God, know not of Jesus. Just like Laura came in through the door, she knew not of a future like this. She knew not, not of gifts that she had and possessed on the inside that have been unlocked. And there's other people out there. And Nehemiah, what if Nehemiah is saying the same thing to us today? Think about your families. Think about your children, your wives. Think about your loved ones. Think about those people who are yet to come. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to give? Are you willing to stand for, for this? Remember where we started. Remember, this is what Nehemiah probably would have said, remember the God of Jacob. Remember the God who parted the Red Sea. Do you remember him? Do you remember the, remember the God of David who conquered the Goliath? Do you remember him? Remember how they crossed the sea? Remember how God led us fire by night and a cloud by day? Remember, he probably said this to them, re rehearsed it. Remember the God we serve. With man it seems impossible, but with God it's impossible. What is it in your life that you need to remember? Maybe you need to remember the day you got saved. Maybe you need to remember the day you broke free from addiction. Maybe you just need to remember the day somebody came and delivered the good news to you. Maybe you need to remember how God moved in your heart and showed you that you were loved. But, but I'm telling you, we, if we're going to face our fears, if we're going to face resistance, we can't do it without remembering who God is and what he's done. And when we remember, we restore strength and we restore faith and we keep moving on a straight path and we let go of distractions and we let go of the booze from the furthest seats in the stand and we stay anchored in our soul and we finish the job at hand. If he's done it before, he can do it again. If he's done it before, he can do it in your life again. If he's done it for Moses, he can do it for you. If he's done it for me, he can do it for your family. He can do it in your marriage. He can do it in your finances. He can do it with your children. He can do it with your family. He can do it in the area of racism. He can do it with the unborn. He can do it with the lost, he can do it in mental health, he can do it in all of these areas. If we pray like it depends on God, and we work like it depends on us. But I'm telling you, God did not send his son Jesus to die for a church that would bow to criticism, that would bow to fear, that would bow to the enemies of this world. Whenever you do something worthwhile, there will always be opposition. Always. Actually, let's even put it this way. If you don't have opposition, you might need to ask yourself, what are we not doing right? So maybe it's time we start to flip the flow. And we start to remove the power from the people or the things which are distracting us and, and taking our energy and taking our power and we stay focused on the mission. The Bible says in our weakness we're made strong. Well, what does that really mean? It means when criticism comes, when insecurities rise up, it causes us 
to find something secure to anchor our soul with, it causes us to go back to what we remember is the foundation of Christ, Jesus. Let's remember. And so maybe you're, you're in here, so go ahead and stand. We're going to go into a song of worship. But maybe you're watching online or you're in person, and it's time to remember. You've been discouraged lately. The walls don't seem very strong. It seems like it's just rubble. Your life right now seems like rubble. It's time maybe for you to say, I'm going to remember. I'm going to remember what God done in the past, not just for me, but there's a cloud of witnesses in this room and online and across the earth today that can all say, I remember when God moved mightily in my life and he can do it again. And maybe you're in here and, and the greatest opposition you have is this thing called sin. You keep falling into the trap and you feel guilty and you're full of shame. You don't feel worthy of God's presence. Well, I've got good news because Jesus sent somebody to conquer the sin, to wipe the slate clean, to clean the debt. You're cleared. You just have to do one thing. You've got to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior once and once for all. And that's you. You're, you're on the field. You're in the game. And so let's say this prayer. If that's you and you want to say a prayer, we'd love to actually empower you and give you a starter pack as well. But just say this prayer. Church, let's help these guys along. God, I thank you for your son, Jesus, who died and rose again and paid the price for all of my sins. I'm brand new. My sins have been wiped away. I'm a brand new creation in, in Jesus Christ. Amen. If you said that, I'd love you just to respond right now. Even let us know online or in person. And we'd love to, to give you a starter pack and we'd love to get you on this path and get you the best art possible to a life of purpose, to a life of making a difference, the best decision you'll ever make. So let's just pray as we go to worship. God, I thank you that you're good. I thank you that you love us. And I thank you that we can make a difference. And God, that we won't bow to fear and we won't get distracted by criticism or insecurity because we're going we're gonna to live like and pray like it depends on you. And we're going to work like it depends on us. In Jesus' name, let's worship.